Hello, I'm Pastor Dave, and this is our sermon for August 15th, 2021. This sermon, entitled Celebration Before God, is based on 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 19. And I would encourage you to read that passage before we begin. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be worthy in your sight. Amen. Now for my generation, I was raised in the church heavily in the 1990s. I remember that decade very well. And there was an interesting component of that decade when it came to the life of the church. And that was what was later entitled the Worship Wars. This basically encapsulates the conflict between traditional worship on one side and contemporary worship on the other. In some cases, it was a generational thing. The older generations typically liked the traditional worship. Younger generations wanted contemporary. But it wasn't dead set. But you did have people falling in really these two camps. But really, in the end, all that really was at stake was the music and the amount of liturgy. One of my preaching professors in seminary pointed this out. His church or the last church he had served, he was retired. When he was there, he had three services. The first one in the morning was traditional. The second was kind of a blended. The third was contemporary. And he really noted that the only thing that really changed the service beyond the music and the amount of liturgy was how he was dressed. He started out wearing a robe at the traditional service, wore a suit at the blended, and wore the jacket, no tie, at the contemporary. The sermon was the same. The scripture passage was the same. All that was really different was the music. And really, people do have preferences on this thing. Thankfully, we're primarily past those wars. It's not that one side, one or the other. We kind of are okay with blending things a bit. And we also accept that people will go where they feel they get something or get the most out of worship. Someone who wants contemporary is not going to go to a church that does traditional, but someone who really wants traditional is probably not going to go to a church that does contemporary. We've kind of let live through the whole mess. Thank heavens for that. But in this passage from 2 Samuel, we kind of see a glimpse of that. Because in this passage, David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem for the first time. And we can very plainly see that everyone worships God different. And we see this right here. Because, you know, big shock. We all think different things are appropriate in worship or not. And really, it's not really a big deal. I mean, some just like things more formal and stoic. Others like things informal and relaxed. We all have our own taste in music. But here, especially with M Michael's action or reaction to David, we see that everyone thinks differently about how to worship God. In fairness, this is what I actually grew up in. My father is a retired United Methodist pastor, and he was very traditional a very liturgical pastor. He liked wearing the robe and stole every single Sunday, except in summer when it was too hot. But we had a call to worship in every service in a unison prayer. We sang the Gloria Patri. We typically had the Apostles' Creed at the end of the service. And when it came to Holy Communion, especially if my dad could swing it, we did the musical setting. We sang the liturgy. It's a beautiful way of doing it. He was the type that they want the, the traditional Christmas Eve at 11 p.m. ending at midnight, and that's how you do church. My mother, on the other hand, who grew up in the EUB tradition, as opposed to my father's Methodist tradition, preferred gospel music, meaning that I was raised on the Gaithers and the Oak Ridge Boys, and you name it, and had a different view of what Christmas Eve should be and what should be part of worship. She always thought my dad was too traditional. My dad kind of thought he was... Well, I didn't say much. He knew better. But really, the biggest difference was the type of music I was subjected to in the car. Classical or gospel. And this kind of shows that really it is down to personal preference. How best we relate to God. How we think we connect best to the divine. 
And it's not always bad. The only problem comes is when many people can think that their way is the only correct way. Like the only correct way to sing is a Wesleyan hymn. Or the only correct way to sing is a gospel hymn. Or with instruments or no instruments. Having the liturgy or not having liturgy. Who's to say which one is right? And this is what we really see. I mean, we'll gloss over Uzzah dying by when he accidentally touched the ark. But we have David dancing before the ark as it enters the city, worshiping. We know David was an artistic soul. I mean, he was a great psalmist, a musician. Of course he was going to dance. But then Nicole, who was Saul's daughter, saw this and came to despise David because he was the ruler. And there he was, dancing publicly, making a fool of himself. And really, we can be the same way. I mean, think of some of the great divisive issues that we get into in churches. I'll give you some ideas. How about this? Which is the appropriate translation of the Bible? In some churches, if you're not preaching out of King James, you're wrong. In other churches... If you're preaching out of King James, you're wrong. You should be using something more modern. And really, who's to say who's right? Which translation do you use? How about instruments? Is the organ or piano the only way? Or should you have a praise band? Should you have instruments at all? Or another fun one. Let's talk about prayer. Do you have written out unison prayers? Or should all prayers be extemporaneous? And when we get to the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? Trespass, sin, debt. Do we add thine as a kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever? Amen. Look that one up. There's so many ways we have little differences and most of this is preference. So how do we deal with this? Well, to start, it is acceptable to celebrate one's faith. This gets into the idea of what we do in worship. Do you sit stoically in the pew and don't show any emotion or are you going to swing from the chandeliers and handle snakes if it's my church we're not getting anywhere close to snakes but really we should be allowed to celebrate it now granted everyone celebrates differently some people react differently some are more reserved some are more outgoing but we should really celebrate our faith and not mourn it or dread it I mean, think about how you come into church on Sunday morning. Do you celebrate it? Or do you go with a sense of dread and obligation? Really, celebration is part of our faith. One of the best ways of seeing this is in the liturgical colors. Now, if you look at the altars in the churches, at least in my churches, there's cloths that are over the altars, and they seemingly change color. It's not dependent on the mood of the pastor or the person who does it. There's an actual calendar that says what color you use on any given season or Sunday. Purple being for Lent and Advent, green for most of the time, ordinary time, red for Pentecost, and maybe a few weeks after the Pentecost in that season, and then white for Easter, Christmas, Trinity Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, little ones and a few other days here and there. Those colors have meaning. I mean, green ideally is for growth, Red, fire, the tongues of fire on Pentecost. Purple is for the season of preparation. But white is meant to be the season of feast, the color of the feasts. I don't know about anyone else, but when I hear the word feast, I don't think of something dreary. I think of something celebratory. Why else do you feast but to celebrate? And in that alone, we see that there in the liturgical calendar, we're reminded to celebrate. We should celebrate Christmas, celebrate Easter, celebrate the Trinity, celebrate Christ as King. We should celebrate our time with God, celebrate our salvation. But more than that, there's also something interesting with our faith, and that is that there should be a freedom to worship God. I don't mean this in a literal right sense, but the freedom in how we worship God. I mean, really, there's no one standard set way to do it. A lot of it goes into tradition or what's appropriate for that group of people. If you look throughout the New Testament especially, you don't really see a set required formula of you must do this, then this, then this, then this. 
really in doing some of the work for the sermon, I looked at some and you get about like the sharing, you get about prayer, learning, singing, but that's about it. You don't really get into whether or not an instrument's allowed or not. It doesn't say they're required, but it doesn't say they're banned. It doesn't talk about what has to be a part of it and what isn't, whether someone preaches from something they wrote or just reads scripture. Really, the only thing that you see in there is what's required. And that is your attitude in coming to worship. Your attitude is what is important. And that's where that freedom is. Because that means, I mean, your attitude of worship, your attitude of praise of God is expressed differently. And that's why there's so many different ways of worship. That's why in some churches, if you have more than a five-minute sermon, people are going to cry. Others, if you're less than 30, they're going to think you didn't earn your paycheck. Some churches don't want instruments. They just want a cappella music. Some want full orchestras. Some want to stay in the pews. Some think you should have more comfortable chairs instead of pews. Some churches, nowhere to sit at all. You stand the whole time. Some read one passage of scripture, some read four, some have choirs, some do not. There's so many ways that we can express our worship of God, but the key is that the attitude is correct. If we have the attitude of worship, from there we can, we have the freedom to worship. And that reminds us of really the entire point of worship. It's not something we do out of obligation, it's something we should want to do. Because by connecting to God via worship, we can draw closer to God. In many ways, we can experience God in worship as we're focused on God instead of ourselves. We might get an answer to something we, a question we have. We might find a peace. And really, we should be able to be like David, who was close to God and was able to celebrate and worship and dance before the Lord. That's really the point of worship. Not the details. What's interesting is this is part of our history. And when I say our history, I mean in the United Methodist Church, back through our EUB side, specifically the UB side. But also, we're Pennsylvanians. This is part of our history. There's a sign, even historical marker on this. But this goes back to 18 or 1787. There was a revival happening outside of Lancaster, down in Lancaster County, in the barn of Isaac Long which I believe is still there. Martin Bohm, a humble Mennonite farmer, was preaching at the revival. One of the people there was a German Reformed pastor by the name of Philip Otterby. He was an academically trained pastor, trained in Germany, emigrated to the United States, and was actually serving in York around this time. And Otterby was amazed that what this humble farmer, Mennonite farmer was able to preach. And it was there that Martin and Philip actually embraced and Otterbein proclaimed, Beers and Brother, we are brothers. We can say there's a difference between what became the United Brethren Church and the Mennonite Church. There were differences. But that wasn't what was important. The message of the faith in Christ Jesus Christ as the source of salvation, our triune God is significantly more important than the details exactly of how we go about in worship. So really what we see from our history, but also what we see from David is celebration is about the connection. Celebration and worship is about the connection between us and God. We're likely to express it in different ways. But as long as we're focused on God as we worship that is all that truly matters. Let us pray. Almighty God, in so many ways, we find new and ingenious ways of separating us from one another. In many ways, we do this because we lose sight of you. That you should be the center of our worship, center of our faith, truly the center of our lives. Help us to recenter on you. Help us to focus all of our worship, not on us and what we like, but on you. So that we may truly 
come before you in praise and thanksgiving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this has been a pre-recorded sermon. We live stream this service every Sunday morning at 845 on the East Salem UMC Facebook page. But until next Sunday, I'm Pastor Dave. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.